There are a lot of people who say that when you meditate, you're looking for happiness in a selfish way. That's really not the case. You're training the mind. You're taking responsibility in an area where only you can be responsible. You're responsible for your actions. And where do your actions come from? They come from the mind. And so if you want to act in a responsible way, the mind has to be trained, because it has lots of unruly thoughts, unruly cravings. You've got to get them under control. And this is someone no one else can do for you. You've got to do it yourself. Of course, you're not the only one who benefits as you get your mind under control. Other people are less subject to your greed, aversion, and delusion. And would these people not want you to look for happiness? Well, what are they looking for? They have their idea of what the world should be like, and they'll be happy only if the world is a certain way and if you fit into their view of the world. But there's more to you than your role in their world. You're an agent. You act. And you would act in a skillful way. If they say that you should be out there acting in the world and not sitting here watching your actions in the mind, it's like saying that someone who's off alone practicing the piano is being selfish. They should perform for others. But you practice the piano so that your performance will actually be good to listen to. The world is all too full of people who are performing for others without having practiced. And if that were a matter of performing the piano, you have an idea of what that would be like. And this is the world we see. Performers with no practice. So you're looking at your own mind, taking care of the things that only you can take care of to deal with the problems that you face, that only you can learn how to deal with skillfully. And other people can in and come in and, and help you in a lot of areas. Think of that story of King Garavya. He's been talking with Venerable Ratabala, the young monk, who came from a wealthy family but decided to go forth. The king is curious why. Other people go forth to the homeless life because of loss of relatives, loss of wealth, loss of health. But none of these things were true of Ratabala. And so Ratabala tells that he learned four Dharma summaries from the Buddha. And whether you go forth in response to these, they are good reasons for wanting to practice. Because they show the condition that we're left in. If we're looking for happiness, what do we have to depend on? Where are the dangers? First principle, the world is swept away, it does not endure. Ratabilla gives the example of how you really can't depend on your body. In the case of the king, when he was young, the king was strong. He felt that he had the strength of two people. Now he's 80 years old, and as he himself admits, he means to put his foot in one place and it goes someplace else. So one, you can't depend on your body. Two, the world offers no shelter. There's no one in charge. There's no one to protect you from pain. I mean, people can give you sedatives, painkillers. But there are a lot of pains that even the medicines can't handle. In the case of the king, Ratabella asks the king, do you have a recurring illness? And the king says yes. He has a wind illness, which usually meant in those days shooting pains throughout the body. In the times when he's lying in bed suffering, and his courtiers and his relatives are standing around thinking, maybe he'll die this time, maybe he'll die this time. And Ratabella asks him, can you command them to take part of that pain, share that pain? So you don't have to feel the pain all alone, and so you can make it less for yourself. No, the king says, I have to feel it all on my own. And 
So you can't depend on the people around you. There's a part of the mind where even the people with the best intentions can't get in. They take your pain away. Three, the world has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. Here the king objects. What do you mean, nothing of, it, of its own? I have lots of wealth. But Rantabal asks him, can you take that wealth with you when you go, when you die? And the king says, of course not. I have to leave it behind. So we know that in this life we're going to be faced with situations in which we can't depend on our body. We can't depend on the people around us. We can't depend on our wealth. What do we have to depend on? As Rattabella points out, something very undependable. The world is insufficient, insatiable, a slave to craving. He asks the king, you've got this wealthy kingdom that you rule over. Suppose someone were to come from the east and say there's another kingdom with lots of wealth. The army is weak, you could take them. Would you take them? Would you go to battle? And the king says, yes, of course. Here he is, 80 years old. He's just been made to reflect on the fact that he's old, subject to illness. He's not going to be able to take this stuff with him, but he still wants more. How about if there are a kingdom to the west? Would you take that? Yes. To the south? Yes. To the north? Yes. Across the ocean? Yes. The human mind is un insatiable. This is where the real danger lies, if you can't depend on things outside. And inside you've got this wild card of craving. What are you going to do? Other people can't train it for you. You have to train it yourself. So as you meditate and try to bring your cravings under control, bring your distractions, all the random and loose thoughts, learn how to shed them. That's when you're really being responsible. And again, no one else can do this for you. Which is why you really have to focus on the areas where you are responsible. Make sure you take care of those. This is one of the reasons why the precepts are limited in their focus. Take, for example, the precept against killing. You're not going to be asked to go out and prevent all killing, or to prevent, prevent all stealing, or all this sex going on in the world. You're asked to stop doing these things yourself. In the cases where you would actually do them yourself, or you try to get others to do them, that's where you're responsible. And keep your focus there, in that area, because that's where the work has to be done. As you think about the precepts, you realize it comes down to your intentions. And that brings the focus even further in. This is why we meditate. Get the mind to be intent on one thing and learn how to stay on that one thing that you've decided that will be the focus of your intention. Of course, the training is not simply a matter of what you're doing when you're sitting here with your eyes closed. You also have to look after your mind as you go through the day. This is what sense restraint is all about. After all, the choices you're going to make. The actions you're going to do will depend to a great deal on what you bring into the mind and how you bring it in. That's what restraint is all about. How are you looking at things? How are you listening to things? And what are you looking at? What are you listening to? As both the how and the why are important. The what, of course, will just determine what kinds of stuff you have cluttering your mind as you sit down to meditate. The how will be a matter of whether you're actually strengthening your defilements as you go through the day, or learning how to weaken them. If you let your greed, aversion, and delusion do the looking and the listening, they're going to get strong. And when they're strengthened and you sit down to meditate, you have a bigger enemy to deal with. So is your front-line defense. You're very careful about why you look for certain things, why you listen to certain things.
And as the Buddha says, do this from a position where you maintain mindfulness of the body. In other words, take the breath with you as you go through the day. So the restraint is not onerous. You don't feel hemmed in. This is one of the big problems as we go through the day. We are very strict with ourselves for a while, and then after a while, part of the mind rebels. We feel, oh, maybe the mind needs a little, little long leash. This is where you really have to be careful. Because sometimes it is the case you let it go a little bit, because you still haven't learned the right touch. Restraint of the senses should be something, ideally, that you engage in all the time, which requires the marathon approach. Otherwise, you don't zip as fast as you can at the beginning of the race. You realize this is something where you have to be in here for the long haul. And that requires a pace that you can maintain. So how do you ride herd on your, on your senses without having a sense of being hemmed in? It's only then that you get a sense of momentum, and the practice can pick up momentum, be strong. Otherwise, you build up a certain amount of skill, and then you squander it. And at the same time, you miss a lot of lessons. Because when that urge comes in, I need to look at something else, I need to listen to something else that's outside of the Dharma. You have to ask why. And if you don't challenge that voice in the mind, you'll never learn about it. You'll simply say, well, this is the way I am, this is the way the nature of the mind is. And those things let, get left unexplored. Again, you become a slave to craving. Because the only way you're going to get out of that slavery is if you resist. Why? You just say, no, I'm going to stick with my restraint. And then see what reasons the mind gives. Because that's, these are the reasons that will also make you be willing to give in to greed, and give in to aversion, and give in to delusion. They're nothing else but the defilements. As John Munn says, it's only to be expected that we slip off the path every now and then to begin with. But that's a sign that we're not on the path quite the right way. We haven't learned how to make the path something we can live in. And that requires skill. So when you say no to a particular defilement, when it wants to look for something to get angry about or something to get greedy about, you need to learn how to say no in a way that you, where you don't feel hemmed in. You know, you understand the reasons or why it's not good to go there. And you acquiesce to the reasons. This means that a large part of the committee of the mind has to be on board. So it's not just a simple matter of putting up a fence. You also have to reason with the mind, get your attitude right. Thinking about the sights of the world and the sounds of the world, not so much as a playground. But it's an area where you have to be very careful. And at the same time, learn how to protect that sense of well-being that can come from staying with the breath inside, or having at least a still center as you go through the day. Learn how to enjoy that. Find a rhythm of breathing that feels right. Not too long, not too short. Some people suggest something between five and six seconds for an inhale, five or six seconds for the exhale. Try that out. Make your own adjustments so that you have the sense of well-being as you go through the day. And then the hungers of the mind will seem a lot less persuasive. So it's in this way that you're responsible. Responsible for the intake of the mind. 
And then once things are there in the mind, you're responsible for how you use them and how they come out in your actions. This is something that only you can be responsible for. As I said, you do this primarily for your own benefit, because nobody else is going to be able to protect you from the suffering that comes when you're not responsible. But it's not selfish. Other people will benefit too. So practice well. Practice your scales. Practice day in and day out, so that when you perform, the performance will be something that's really pleasant to see, pleasant to hear, both for you and the people around you.